Acts 23, 1 through 5. Amen. Uh, you please pray for me. I got out in the sun, working and didn't drink enough water, and my head's bothering me, and I'm sick on my stomach. Amen. I should have drunk more water than I did, and it's messed me up. Amen. Bible says this, it says, On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty where, wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priest and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Verse 30 really should be in chapter 23 because uh, it's talking about him going before the uh, Sanhedrin council. That's what this is referring to. Uh, as you remember, he uh, got, uh, they about killed him out on the streets and uh, the chief captain rescued him and then he got up to the, stop of the top of the stairs going into the castle and wanted to speak and address the Jews and they didn't want to hear anything he had to say. And so they've kept him in the castle overnight and the chief captain is just uh, he wants to know what's going on, and so he brings the Sanhedrin council in. And so that's what verse 30 is talking about there. Now this is what it said. In verse 1 it said, And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good consciousness before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? And then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. In other words, Paul said, I didn't know he was the high priest. The high priest don't act the way he did. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Amen. I want to preach on the book of Acts, chapter 23. Begin the introduction to that. Amen. You may be seated tonight. God bless you. As we begin to look at chapter 23, you find that Paul is about to appear before the Sanhedrin council where he will be struck in the mouth, that's what the scripture said, and literally be almost killed if you continue reading the story, and we will deal with that. But what happens is, uh, uh, Paul is addressing Pharisees and Sadducees, and he tells them that he is like them, the Pharisees. He believes in the resurrection, and the Sadducees didn't. And so it brought a turmoil, and, and they were literally going to rip that man apart. The Pharisees trying to rescue him, and, and the Sadducees it was trying to kill him. These are all supposed to be the church people. Amen. And they're fighting one against another and, and they're wanting to kill Paul or part of them are. Um, and all this is taking place if you continue reading it. Uh, but he, he, he's struck in the mouth and he's almost killed. And if it wasn't for the chief captain that rescued him again. Uh, from there there's a plot that's devised by 40 men and the Sanhedrin council to murder Paul. Isn't that amazing? Again, here is the people that are supposed to represent God's people, the church, and they're wanting to kill the Apostle Paul. Amen. Understand this has happened all because Paul was determined to go to Jerusalem and from there on to Rome. Uh, he was warned not to go in Acts chapter 21 and 11 and that if he did harm would surely come to him but he said I'm willing to be bound or even die for the name of Jesus Christ I understand he could not be dissuaded by them so they said the Lord's will be done Paul was determined to do God's will he was determined to do what God had called him to do and so while in Jerusalem he's falsely accused of taking the Gentile into the temple and they killed just about killed him in the streets and I told 
told you, but the chief captain rescued him. And that is when Paul told his story and gave God the glory. But the hearers want nothing to do with his message. And so the chief captain, he wants to understand why there is such animosity towards Paul. And so that's where we picked up the text in 2230. He says a meeting set up with the Sanhedrin council. And things go south from there. All because the man of God is simply serving the Lord. All because the man of God is simply loving and living for Jesus. All because this man of God is sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only reason all this is befallen on this man. It results in him being attacked from both the outside world and the church. He's treated harshly from both the world and the church simply for telling others about Jesus and living for God. When you are sincere in your relationship with Christ, you hear me tonight, trouble is coming your way. I said it's going to come your way. When you tell others about Jesus and you earnestly contend for the faith, you will be treated harshly and you will experience resistance. When you sell out and give everything you have to God, I'm telling you trouble will come from the outside world and it will also come from them that say they're your brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm telling you when somebody is sold out, lock, stock and barrel and got the anointing of God on their life trouble's going to hit them from the outside and it's going to hit them from the inside when you're determined as Paul was concerning spiritual matters and concerning the Savior trouble is always around the corner and there will always be some amount of resistance that will come against you Paul is in this predicament simply because he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ and because he lived for Jesus but notice what verse 1 said It said, Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Let me paraphrase that. I've tried to live right in all phases of my life. When I was a Pharisee, I tried my best to live according to the law. Now that I'm a Christian, I'm trying my best to to live according to the Word of God. It's my heart's desire to do my best and to do right in the sight of God. I've done everything I I do with a pure heart and towards God. When I was in Judaism, I'd done it all with a pure heart. Now that I've been born again and I'm in Christianity, I'm doing everything with a pure heart. And if I do wrong, and when I do wrong, I always set things right. I'm not going to make excuses for my wrong. I'm not going to make excuses for my error. And I will not excuse my own sin. I will set things right with man. And I'll set things right with God. I am living in all good consciousness. Can we say tonight that we are living right in all phases of our life? Is it your heart's desire to do right in the sight of God concerning your marriage? Ah, what do you mean, preacher? I'm talking about living right in all phases of your life. Do you treat your spouse the way you ought to? Are you living right in all phases of your life? Are you doing uh, working for your employer the way you're supposed to? Did you know if you have to punch the clock at 8 a.m., you need to be there and punch it at 8 a.m.? And if you've got to work eight hours and you get a 30-minute break, then the only break you should take is the 30 minutes. You need to give them the seven and a half hours work. 
Listen what I'm trying to tell you. He's asking us, are we living right in all phases of our life? Are you living right in your marriage? Are you living right with your employer? Are you living right with your family? Are you living right with your church family? Are you living right in dealings with your neighbors and with the government and with business? Understand, he's asking us, and Paul was saying, in every part of my life, I have lived right. And when it comes to the government, we ain't want to do everything they want to tell us that we need to do sometimes. Amen. But Paul said we need to live right in all phases of our life. Now, if the government is asking us to do something contrary to Scripture, then no, we do not have to do it. Amen. But if it says it in Scripture, we need to live according to the Word of God. Are we living right in all phases of our life when it comes to business matters? Or will we uh, shaft somebody if we can get by with it? I went to Subway yesterday. I got me a sub sandwich. A rotisserie chicken and bacon. And I got back to the table and looked. It didn't say that they charged me for the bacon. I could have walked out the door, Brother Gary. And said, I ain't paying for it. It's their fault. But I went back up there and I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, y'all didn't charge me enough. I said, I bet you ain't heard that much, have you? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, I got rotisserie chicken and bacon. And I said, I don't see anything on here about the bacon. She said, oh, well, see here the way it says rotisserie and the way it wrote out. She said, that tells us there was bacon on it. You really did pay for it. But understand, I wasn't leaving there till I knew that it had been paid for. Or I didn't realize I'd already paid, but I wasn't leaving until I paid for that bacon. I'm trying to live right in all phases of my life. I said I'm trying to live right. What if I hadn't have paid for it and one of them realized it and watched me walk out the door only to come Sunday morning and they walk in this church and see me standing in this pulpit? Now that's the man that cheated us at Subway. Ah, listen, we need to live right in all phases of our life. Ah, is it our desire to do right in the sight of God concerning the church and kingdom work? Can we say we're living right in every phase of our life? And when we are not, are we setting things right? Are we getting things right? If God brought us into His office tonight, and laid the evaluation report out on our life, would it say that you're living right in every phase of your life? And when you are not, you're correcting or setting things right. Paul said to them, I have lived in all good consciousness before God until this day. Well, he barely got the words out of his mouth before the high, high priest commanded that they hit Paul right in the mouth. What it said, wasn't it? Verse 2. The high priest Hananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Now, whether he was struck by an actual man's fist or a shoe that had an iron heel, I don't know. I've read behind commentators that a shoe that had an iron heel was used to strike someone that got out of line or that was lying during a trial. I don't know exactly what they struck him with, but I know one thing. They struck him and they struck him right in his mouth. Now, there's something there to bring out. They done it to humiliate him and to silence him. They wanted to deliver a blow to what he said and what he stood for. They wanted to wound the man and the message. They wanted to punish the man for the life that he lived and the message that he preached. They wanted to smite him. They wanted to strike him. Ah, listen, when your life is right in all phases of your life and you're giving God your best, you might as well go ahead and get ready, brother and sister, because you're going to get hit right in your mouth spiritually. Might as well go ahead and get ready. Because there's going to be folks that'll want to silence you 
and shut you down. There will be folks that want to what I call smite the righteousness, purity, and godliness that is seen in you because it reminds them of their own evil life. Yeah, that's right. Amen, I got one amen. I said if they will want to smite the righteousness and purity and godliness seen in you because it reminds them of their own evil life. That they'll want to wound the goodness and the holiness of Christ that is seen in you. They'll want to silence you and shut down that that is in you that came from Jesus Christ. They want to punish you for your godly life and the gospel message that it brings. They cannot stand the thought of it being seen or talked about. They want you canceled. They want you silenced. Because you're separated from the world. They want you canceled in silence to keep you from spreading Christianity. To keep you from sharing God's love. And they will humiliate us and they will strike us right in our mouths spiritually. If they feel it will keep us from making a difference in God's kingdom. They had love nothing more than to silence the singing, the teaching, and the preaching. They had love nothing more than to shut down Christian values and godly behavior because godliness always awakens wickedness. And they want to silence Christianity and every one of God's workers. They want to hit us in the mouth hoping it will silence God's word and the messenger of God. But notice something here. Paul stood his ground. They tried to strike or deliver a fatal blow. They mocked him. They struck him. And they crucified Jesus. Amen. They tried to shut him down. But Jesus stood his ground too. And said if I be lifted up. I'll draw all men to me. Shepherds sold him. And wise men did too. Fishermen sold him. And doctors did too. Tax collectors sold him. And tax cheats sold him too. Harlots sold him. And blind men sold him too. I'm trying to tell you. And they're still trying to silence him and shut him down tonight but I come to tell you all their efforts have failed because he's still calling the multitudes all that are sinners all that are weary and heavy laden and lost in direction come unto me they tried to shut Jesus down and they tried to shut Paul down but both of them stood their ground now you hear me when this world comes to shut you down, you stand your ground. When the devil hits you in the mouth, shake it off and stand your ground and keep on living and keep on speaking and keep on working and keep on loving and keep on looking for the coming of the Lord. You're going to be hit in the mouth when you're living right in all phases of your life. But you stand your ground and keep going on. After Paul got hit in the mouth, notice what he said. In verse 3, he said, God will smite you, you witted wall, or thou whited wall rather. God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For you sit there and judge me after the law, but yet you command me to be smitten contrary to the law. Now let me tell you what Paul's saying there. He says, you sit to judge me after the law, but yet you go against the law yourself because you hit me. You say that you're an a minister of the law, but you ain't a real good example of it. Then Paul said, surely, 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 in verse 5, this cannot be the high priest, especially acting in that manner. Verse 4 and 5 said they stood by and said, Revilest thou God's high priest? And then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. In other words, I didn't know he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. 
See, Paul, I don't believe, really understood or knew that that was the high priest because of the actions of this administrator. And Paul calls him out. And the apostle said to him, You speak one thing, but you do another thing. And Paul tells him, he says, you are a whited wall. You're a mass of clay chalked over. He tells him, you're a white robe covering a black heart, a religious character covering a corrupt conduct, a spiritual title covering a sinful heart, a clean appearance covering a rotten core. You're a whited wall. Your actions are inconsistent with a high priest. You've got cracks in your wall and they are real bad and you've tried to cover the cracks with paint but it will not work cause God sees the cracks in the wall you're a whited wall a wall with cracks that's been painted over and you're going down listen there's a warning there tonight for you and for me make sure you keep yourself from becoming a whited wall. Make sure that you do not have a white robe covering a black heart, a clean appearance covering a rotten core, a spiritual title covering a sinful heart, a religious character covering a corrupt character. Make sure that you keep yourself from becoming a whited wall. A life filled with sin, cracks in it that you're trying your best to cover up. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the kind that says one thing, but yet they do another. The kind that demands one way for certain ones, but will make exceptions for others and themselves. Yeah, I've seen it. Seen it many times. You got certain ones in the church and the preacher is real close to them or, 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 or he's got grandbabies that want to do things and he will make exemptions for them that he won't make for the ones that he's not so in love with. I've seen it where there's been people living in the church that their youngins wanted to play basketball and they was told, your youngins can't play basketball because they cannot wear shorts. But when it was time for their grandbabies to play basketball, they could amazingly wear shorts. Now listen, if you're going to be that way, you're going to have to be that way every day. That's right. I said, that's right. I don't play that game. Not making one exception for one person and, 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 in, and treating another one differently. It's going to be the same for everybody, brother. You're either going to do right or you're going to do wrong, but we ain't going to have one doing wrong and letting it slide. I said, I can't do that, brother. If I am, I'm not the man of God that I'm supposed to be. Him and it's got to be the same for everybody. I can't treat you different. I can't treat Paul one way and treat Andrew another way. I can't treat David one way and Brandon another way. It has to be an even kill. It has to be the same across the board. Amen to God. And that's what he's talking about here. It's the kind that says or demands one way for a certain person but it makes exceptions for others and themselves in other words I can't get up here and preach to you and tell you you need to live this way and that way and me go home and do exactly opposite of what I've told you They're white at walls. They've got cracks and sin in their life. And instead of dealing with it, they paint over it. They tell others how they need to live. And they ain't living what they're telling others. They tell others they're wrong. Uh, uh, but except when they are wrong. They'll tell others when they're wrong. But they will accept or won't accept when they are wrong. They're whited walls. And eventually the walls will fall. Make sure tonight 
Make very sure tonight you ain't no whited wall. Let's get the cracks fixed in our lives. Not painted over and covered up. Paul said to Ananias the high priest, Thou whited wall, God will smite you. In other words, God will judge you. Understand, we're going to all be judged. Come on, sister. Notice their response in verse 4. And they that stood by said, Revile us, thou God's high priest. They were saying, Why are you railing on him and heaping abuse upon the high priest? You know that's contrary to the law. They didn't have no problem with the high priest going against the law, though, did they? Paul had done nothing deserving of being hit in the mouth. Done nothing deserving of being abused. Nor had he been found guilty of any crime or wrongdoing. You know what this is? This is a classic case of a double standard. We're seeing it play out in America as well as in many churches. Now you, you, I'm not going to try to be too political here. But you hear what I'm telling you? Certain people are above the law. And politicians and others are below the law. It's playing out right now. I said it's playing out right now. The current or the former president is below the law. He's already guilty and they won't even tell him the charges that's against him. So his lawyers and his attorneys, they can, uh, they can uh, uh, fight the thing, know what they're fighting. They don't even want to tell them what he's supposedly done. But then you get on the other side and you've got a current president. You've got one uh, that was trying to be the president. And you've got so many others that they have got proof that they've done wrong. And yet what well, one thing's done to them. It's a double standard. I told Lynn, her daddy got hit and the man that hit him was a company van. It was his company and didn't have any insurance. Now, years ago, if a man did that and he didn't have any insurance, they put him in jail. But they didn't put him in jail. They sent him right on down the road. I'm telling you, we're in America where there is a double standard. There's a double standard against the Christian. Michigan State come out with all the words that are offensive and shouldn't be said. Easter. Christmas tree. Eggs. The word egg, when it's used around Easter time. If it's not Easter, it's okay to say the word egg. I'm not making this up, folks. This is real. And they said the reason why they're excluding all these words, there was more than that. And a lot of them was tailored around the church. They said the reason that you shouldn't use these words is we're trying to make we're trying to have equity and inclusiveness. And I said, Lynn, they are taking away from the very thing that they're trying to champion. They say they want inclusiveness, but they are excluding the Christian. It's a double standard. Well, they can get mad or glad. It don't matter to me. I hope somebody from Michigan State's watching. Because I'll say Christmas tree. I'll say Easter egg. Amen. I'll say Jesus. I'll say the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I'll say the blood of the Lamb of God is what washes a man's sin away. And I really don't care what they think about it. It's playing out in America. But it sometimes plays out in the church as well. Where we'll see certain criteria is required for some in the church, but not others. Certain expectations are demanded of others in the church, but not of the ones that are doing the demanding. Amen. Saw it at my past church. 
had come to me demanding me to take care of this and take care of that. And yet the ones that was demanding me to do these things wasn't doing them their own self. Certain expectations demanded of others in the church. But when it comes to them, exceptions should be made. Preachers that preach one way and live another way. What are you talking about? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. There's preachers out there that will do anything to get a, a preaching gig, if you will. What do you mean? I mean, they'll go anywhere that they can get in, and if the church does not have any problem with sin, they'll preach exactly what that church is, the way the church is. I'm not talking about preach against it. I'm talking about they'll go along with it. As long as they can get in that pulpit and get a, a couple of dollar bills to go out the door with. I'm telling you, they'll preach one way and they'll live another way. And they'll go one church and preach one way and go to another church and preach the other way. But I come to tell you tonight, I'm not doing it. I said I'm not doing it. I've had three churches and I preached to every one of them the same way. And everywhere I go, I preach the same way. Be on guard tonight. Stand with me. Do not become a victim of this thing called a double standard. So as we get ready to pray, what are the things we need to pray about tonight? First, let's ask the Lord for an evaluation of our life. To see if we're living right in all phases of our life. If we're living in good conscience. Secondly, when we get hit in the mouth spiritually. When there's an attempt to silence, wound, or cancel us. That the Lord will give us the strength to stand our ground. Third, that we do not become a whited wall. Fix the cracks. Don't paint over them in an effort to hide them. Bible said in the book of Proverbs, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. In other words, you can't paint over the cracks. You have to fix them. Get cracks in the wall, Brother Scott, while you put on them. Fill them with filler, don't you? Amen. When you get cracks in your life, you got to fill it with the filler. What is it, brother? It's the blood. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. That is what you use to fill the cracks. Amen. Fix the cracks. Don't paint over them. And last but not least, what you expect out of others you need to demand out of your own self. That's what we need to pray tonight. Are we living right in all phases of our life? When we get hit in the mouth, give us the strength to stand our ground. Don't become a whited wall. Fix the cracks. And what you expect out of others, demand out of yourself. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight. Show us if we're not living right in all phases of our life. Show us the places where we need to change and make correction, God. And God, give us the strength and the grace that when we get struck in the mouth in an attempt to silence us, give us the strength and the grace to stand our ground. And God, help us not to become a whited wall Help us to identify the cracks in our wall. Let them be filled with the blood of the Lamb and not be covered up. And God, help us that what we expect out of others, we demand out of ourselves as well. Help us, Lord, not to be a hypocrite. Touch us tonight. Make us better Christians and make us better people of God. And we'll praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name. 
And everybody, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, she's got choir practice tonight, so please remember that right now. Amen.